Welcome to episode 8 of the DNA Papers podcast, where we continue in our travels back in time to revisit the milestones in the history of the DNA molecule through discussions of both the famous and lesser known original papers published about various aspects of the discovery, chemistry, and biological functions of this important molecule. Our previous episode centered on the justly famous 1944 paper by Oswald Avery and his colleagues Colin McLeod and McLean McCarty showing that DNA was the carrier of heredity, at least in some bacteria. In contrast, today's episode focuses on a largely overlooked pair of papers, which happened to emerge from the same laboratory. The first of these papers, by McCarty alone, was published in the Journal of General Physiology and bears the title Purification and Properties of Desoxyribonuclease Isolated from Beef Pancreas. It's worth noting that the key word here is desoxyribonuclease, which is an enzyme, rather than desoxyribonucleic acid, which is the DNA molecule itself. The second paper discussed today was co-authored by McCarty and Avery and published in the same journal as the 1944 paper, that is, the Journal of Experimental Medicine. It even bears the same main title as the original, namely, Studies on the Chemical Nature of the Substance-Inducing Transformation of Pneumococcal Types. But, whereas the first paper suggested the identity of the said substance, this 46th paper was, as the subtitle tells us, a report on the effect of desoxyribonuclease on the biological activity of the transforming substance. Here to illuminate the story of these papers and reflect on why they have received short shrift in history is our distinguished panel of guests, all of whom have participated in previous episodes in the series. So, I'll offer only very brief introductions before turning the conversation into their capable hands. The first guest I'd like to welcome back is Mark Lorch from the University of Hull, where he does double duty as a professor of chemistry and science communication. I asked Mark to join us back today because he's the only chemist by or biochemist in today's company. Everyone else comes to these papers from a molecular biological or history of molecular biology slant. Therefore, Mark brings a different and very unique perspective to the nature of the data and evidence furnished in today's paper. Welcome, Mark. Great to be here. Thanks for inviting me back. Providing some continuity with the previous episode is our next guest, science writer Jeff Montgomery, who conducted extensive interviews with Mac McCarty, the central figure in today's episode. I had the privilege of tagging along for some of these conversations, and I'm delighted that we have a chance to revisit this chapter of DNA history together once again. A warm welcome back also to Michel Morange from École Normale Supérieure in Paris, France, who's probably best known by the consortium's community for his magisterial writing on the history of molecular biology. Michelle chose to participate in this episode over the previous one precisely because he agreed with my sense that McCarty's work on this enzyme, DNAs, has been too long ignored in the annals of history. Welcome, Michelle. It's really great to have you back in the series. Rounding out our roster of speakers today is Jan Witkowski from Cold Spring Harbor Laboratories in New York who has rubbed shoulders with many of the personalities who have been featured or who will be featured in future episodes in this series. Like Jeff, Jan has memories to share of conversations with Mac McCarty, and I'm keen to get his take on the significance of Mac's contributions to the DNA story. Thank you for joining us, Jan. Welcome, everyone, and let's get started with our discussion. Normally, I begin by asking this bold question, what are these papers about? Today, I'm going to modify that question just a tiny bit, because while I would still like all of you to offer elevator pitches on the papers, I would like to ask one of you 
Jeff perhaps, to offer a similar pitch to bring us up to speed and connect the last episode with today's as groundwork for understanding the papers today. Jeff. Well, the 1946 Journal of Experimental Medicine paper, as you indicated in your introduction, is explicitly presented as a follow-up to the famous 1944 paper that we discussed last time, which began a revolution in biology by showing for the first time that DNA has genetic powers, a shocking and very mysterious finding at the time because it was previously almost universally believed that genes were made of protein. And also, as you said in the, your introduction, both papers, both of the JEM papers have the same title, Studies on the Chemical Nature of the Substance Inducing Transformation of Pneumococcal Types, but different subtitles. The 1944 paper we discussed last time recounts in great detail the decade-long process of chemical purification that enabled Avery, McLeod, and McCarty to identify the transforming substance in a DNA fraction isolated from pneumococcal bacteria type 3. It describes evidence from chemical, physical, chemical, and enzymatic studies that all converge on the conclusion that it is very probably DNA and DNA alone in this fraction that is responsible for the genetic transformation of pneumococcal types. But Avery, who wrote the introduction discussion of the 1944 paper, presented this DNA conclusion rather cautiously. For instance, the last sentence of the 1944 paper in the discussion begins, if the results of the present study on the chemical nature of the transforming principle are confirmed. The two 1946 papers carry Avery's cautious conclusion forward, I think, in a very clear and decisive way by focusing on an enzyme that Macklin McCarty has purified called deoxyribonuclease, or DNAs. McCarty shows that very small quantities of the DNA enzyme specifically break up or depolymerizes long-chain DNA molecules from both mammalian and bacterial cells and also destroys a transforming extract's ability to induce genetic transformation of pneumococcal bacterial types, leaving little doubt, in McCarty's words, that the transforming substance is indeed DNA and DNA alone, but both the 1944 and 1946 papers also end with the same fundamental mystery for the future, the chemical basis by which DNA could possess and direct specific genetic functions was unknown and indeed at that time unimaginable. Thank you. Mark, I'd like you to specifically give your chemist's perspective on the first of the 246 papers we're discussing today, which is about the purification and properties of the DNAs. So this is this is a fascinating paper, actually, not least because actually I wasn't really very familiar with it before you brought it to my attention. And my background is actually in, in studying protein structures, functions and folding. And so I spent a great deal of time, particularly during my early part of my career, purifying proteins from various sources, from all sorts of things, from bacteria, from eyeballs, all sorts of horrible, horrible materials like this. So I had a great deal of sympathy for those involved in this paper where they're, they're extracting them from pounds and pounds of pancreas. And what I re was really marveling at is that in my day when I was using pro purification techniques, you know, I was I had affinity columns that stuck to the you know that the proteins would stick to and I got I had centrifuges that I could use and genetically tagged proteins that would 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 allow me to do all sorts of purification systems really quite quickly. And They've got none of this back in 1946. They start out with 10 pounds of beef pancreas. And actually, I love this table in this paper. It starts out with 10 pounds of, of pancreas and then switches from pounds to liters to grams. You know, it's like no consistency in units here either. It's, you know, from imperial to metric, etc. Anyway, it's marvelous. But all the only way that they are using to purify this protein is by essentially fractional precipitation. So they add ammonium sulfate to these extracts of, of beef pancreas, which have literally been put through a meat grinder and then smashed through a cheesecloth. And then they, they add ammonium sulfate to it. And this causes a lot of the proteins to come out of solution. 
and they then redissolve some of that by removing the ammonium sulfate and then add, a, add ammonium sulfate back in again at a lower concentration and go through this process multiple times. Now, I did use this sort of technique before, but again, between every step when I did it, I managed to centrifuge it down. They had to leave it to settle for days just under gravity. And eventually they ended up with then, you know, a gram or two of dried enzyme from those pounds and pounds of beef pancreas. And actually, I'm mar I marvel at how pure they managed to get this substance. I think it was something like, oh, we have to look at check my numbers here somewhere. I think it was something like 99.99% .99 pure as far as they could gather. Now, the problem that they encountered throughout this system, though, is that pancreas, not, it was clearly rich in the enzyme that they were interested in, the, the DNAs, but pancreas also secretes trypsin and chymotrypsin, which are enzymes that cut up other enzymes. Okay, you use them in your digestive system. It helps you digest the proteins that you eat. And the trypsin and chymotrypsin then would digest the DNAs. So at the same time as they're purifying the DNAs, they've got, they're also purifying the trypsins and so on um, that are cutting up the DNAs they're interested in. So they've got this battle going on between these two systems. And actually what they hit upon is actually it's something really quite simple, something a technique that had been used before in the end. And that's by doing all of this purification system at really low pH, at about pH 0 0.2 three using sulfuric acid basically and, and at that concentration the none of the enzymes work anymore um so they can purify out all of the uh, go through all their steps purify out all the trypsin and chymotrypsin and then take the ph back up to to more or less neutral where the dna is then can is active again and there's only tiny tiny trace amounts of the trypsin and chymotrypsin left which is still a bit of a problem because over periods of time that will still cut up the DNAs, but it was enough for them to be able to use that in their latest studies. So, so there you go. That's the summary of that paper. I said marvellous that they managed to produce such pure protein with such limited techniques at hand. Could you also talk a little bit about the specific action of this protein DNAs that they were purifying? So the point of this is why they wanted this protein in the first place is that the DNAs cuts up DNA. Enzymes all end in A's and so DNAs is an enzyme that cuts up, digests DNA. So the point here then is they could, by having this enzyme, they could apply it to their solution of DNA that they are yeah. It would cut up the DNA, and then if they use that solution then to digested DNAs to try and transform the bacteria, yeah, if that those bacteria then were transformed, then that would demonstrate that it, it can't have been DNA that was responsible for the transformation. Yeah. Now, what they actually saw is that every time when they applied the DNAs treated DNA to the bacteria, they weren't transformed. Therefore, it supported their hypothesis that DNA is responsible for the transformation that carries the genetic material. Do you have anything to add to that? Jan? Well, I, I think probably I, all I need to do is endorse both what Jeff and, and Mark commented on. The method of preparation that McCarthy was using, uh, using was heroic. And as Mark pointed out, it's extraordinary these days to look back on how things had to be done then, as he said, no ultra centrifuge, no gels, no affinity columns. And their assay system was not exactly the most simple and straightforward, measuring the de decrease in viscosity of a solution of, of DNA. So that even the even the assay method was rather heroic. And it also it also particularly struck me Jeff's point about what I think is a change of tone in, in this paper. The tone is much more assertive than it had been in the original 1944 paper. There are things like the transforming factor is largely, if not exclusively, deoxyribonucleic. It strongly suggests that nucleic acid itself is responsible. Now, whether that tone is perhaps because McCarty maybe had more influence in writing the paper or whether Avery was becoming more and more confident himself. I don't know how one would, would discover that. 
but certainly the change in tone of this paper is really quite significant. Jeff, you had something to say? Yes, just on that point, you're exactly right. In the conversations I had with Mac McCarty that, and Neerja participated in some of these, he wrote the experimental part of the 1944 paper and then worked with Avery to edit it, but Avery wrote the introduction discussion in his typical cautious manner. And Mac wrote the whole, McCarty wrote the whole of the 1946 paper. So he is much more emphatic and he makes the point that if he and McLeod had written the discussion in the 44 paper, they would have been more forceful in their conclusions than Avery was. I'm going to move on to the next question. So maybe, Michelle, you can pick this one up. What is the place of these papers, this pair of papers on DNAs, purification of DNAs and the effect of DNAs on the transforming principle? What is the place of these papers in the history of DNA? Uh, how does it help us understand the history of our current knowledge of DNA better? Okay. I think these articles are not comparable to the 1944 article, because the 1944 article was announcing something radically new, transforming principle can be DNA. These two articles, which are linked, it's a pair of articles, demonstrates by using pure DNAs that, in fact, DNAs, pure DNAs, is able to abolish a transforming activity, and so it's a strong support to the hypothesis that the transforming principle is DNA. And also, I think, one important point is that it was somehow give a compliment to the article of 19. 44, because in this article, it was shown, these experiments were done with purified RNAs, purified protease, but only crude extract containing DNA's activity. Now, you have the three kinds of enzymatic activities, pure, and only the DNA is able to abolish the activity of, of the transforming principle. So I think they complement, but also in the article of McCarthy, the second one, and Avery and McCarthy, there are very interesting points raised in the two-page discussion. One concerning argument in favor of DNA, and one interesting point is that, okay, DNA is certainly necessary, but this experiment does not suppress a model in which DNA would be the bearer of a protein activity responsible for the transforming principle. Because in this case, you cut DNA, you have no longer activity. The second interesting point of the discussion is about the amount of transforming principles. Somehow you have a lot of DNA, how to express this amount, and McCarthy and Avery say that probably it's because this DNA is responsible for many other activities in the cell. And I think you must relate this with the recent result of Bidoli Tatum on the relation between genes and enzymes. And the third point, which is also interesting that it was discussed previously, is a problem of specificity. DNA looks non-specific with a monotonous structure, and nevertheless, it has to be specific. And interestingly, they propose a comparison with immunoglobulins. In ultracentrifugation, immunoglobulins are all migrating in the same way. Nevertheless, immunoglobulins, antibodies, have different specificities. And this is it, probably the same. It's interesting, I think, because uh, we know now that the specificity of immunoglobulin is due to the protein sequence. So somehow it opens to the uh, sequence of DNA as a possible explanation of the specific role of DNA. Okay, that was, I think, what this article brings in the field. Yes, I think Michelle is right. It certainly did not confirm that DNA was the hereditary material. 
even as late as a symposium at Oak Ridge in 1955, Ken Cooper was still bringing up the hoary old chestnut of Avogadro's number, and whether there was still glycoprotein there that could act as a seed for a new synthesis of coat. Hotchkiss's response was he thought it was no longer a prime obligation to bring further evidence that protein was absent. The onus was now on those who claimed there was a protein. And I think the other point about when one considers the role of a a science paper in history, the paper itself, the findings of the paper, of course, have long been superseded. And the important point for the history of DNA is the impact that these papers had on other people who then went on to, to do work. And of course, the prime example here was was Shargaff, who changed his program of research to follow up on Avery's findings. And Jim, Jim Watson refers to Avery's paper in the double helix, and he says, Avery's experiment made it, DNA, smell like the essential genetic material. And that encouraged Jim to go off after DNA. And he goes on to say, so working out DNA's chemical structure might be the essential step in learning how genes duplicated. I actually had a lunch with Jim last week, and I asked him about what he could remember of Avery's experiment. Of course, it was 75 years ago, and he said, well, you know, my memory is not what it used to be. Jeff? I think Michelle and Jan did an excellent job of placing it within the history of studies of DNA. At some point, I think it would be interesting to talk about its place in the internal history of the Avery lab and the inspiration and paradigm for this DNA work that came out of the work of Rene DeMose. And I I could tell that story now. I think it would be interesting to go back to an episode in the history of the Avery lab that provided the inspiration paradigm from McCarty's DNA's work, finding an enzyme that is specific for DNA and destroys its biological activity. And this is Rene DeBose's work in the late 1920s, finding the so-called S3 enzyme that specifically destroys the very same type 3 capsular polysaccharide that is a phenotypic readout of this transformation system. So in the 1944 paper, there's one figure. You have an unencapsulated mutant version of type 2, tiny little dot, and then you have this juicy, mucousy, type 3 pneumococcal bacteria with the type 3 capsule. And when Avery and Michael Heidelberger first established in 1923 and 1924 that these capsules were made of polysaccharides, that was a great surprise because they knew the capsular polysaccharides were the primary antigen target for protective antibodies. And it had been thought that, again, only proteins could serve as antigens. So they had to go to a lot of trouble to convince themselves that it was indeed the polysaccharide that was the primary substance of the capsule and the primary antigen target for protective antibodies, and not what Avery termed in a report to the Rockefeller, a tenaciously adhering impurity, that is, a protein in their purification process. And just to get an idea of how McCarty started his work on the transformation process, and then after they published the 44 paper, went after purification of the enzyme specific for DNA. When he came to the lab in September 1941, he had no idea that they were working on transformation because nothing had been published since a Lionel Alloway paper in 1933. And the way he found out about this is the way that everybody found out really about what was going on in the Avery lab through these monologues that Avery gave that were called the Red Seal Records. And McCarty describes this in a nice chapter in his 1985 book, The, the Transforming Principle, My Initiation. I thought it'd just be nice to, to kind of give a flavor of what life was like in this lab, headed by this pretty remarkable guy, Oswald Avery, who came to the Rockefeller in 1913, before World War I, and established this experimental system that provided the gateway to the understanding that uh, DNA has genetic powers, but was in fact established for medical purposes, to study infectious disease and in fact to develop therapies in this pre-antibiotic, pre-penicillin era. Actually, before I get into this, let me just read the end of this DeBose-Avery paper, which is very parallel 
to the end of this 1946 JEM paper on how DNA leaves little doubt that DNA is the, a transforming principle and not some impurity. So this is DuBose and Avery when they have an enzyme that's specific, the S3 enzyme for the type 3 capsule. Same capsule that's being studied in the transformation process. Finally, it may be mentioned that the first question which fostered this inquiry has been answered. The decomposition of the capsular polysaccharide of one of the specific types of pneumococcus by a mild enzymatic action results in the loss of specific perceptibility of this substance in anti-pneumococcus serum, that is, antibodies of the homologous type for type 3. That the polysaccharide and not some impurity, that is a protein, not some impurity carried along with it, is responsible for type specificity is once more proved and probably beyond doubt. The specificity of the types of pneumococcus is illustrated also by the remarkably specific action of this enzyme which attacks only the capsule polysaccharide of type 3 pneumococcus. In fact, this enzyme appears as specific as an antibody. And McCarty heard this story along with the transformations. Mark, would you like to add anything? Yeah, I was just going to say, actually, I'm not in any way a science historian. So, you know, a lot of this information, actually, I'm coming to for the first time. And actually, what strikes me is how, by this point, it looks to me, you know, like the evidence for DNA as the genetic material is really overwhelming. But it's fascinating, though, that there's still these pockets of resistance to it that people are so wedded still to their to their dogma and it, and it says something actually about how despite science really being about making um, evidence-based decisions how you know we're still still human we all still want to stick to the things that we believe for a long period of time Jan's comment that if people believed that proteins were the genetic material that they needed to now prove that in a way it's a bit like you know Bertrand Russell's teapot um you know that famous sort of bit of philosophy that Bertrand Russell said you can't prove that there isn't a teapot orbiting between Mars and Jupiter but that doesn't mean it's there your inability to disprove that so it was, it's just fascinating really that people are so wedded to their dogma still despite this overwhelming evidence and how slow and difficult it can be to change those dogmas Jan Yes, picking up on Mark's point there, it's in the reading list that Mac McCarty and uh, Stan Prusner published a little essay together, pointing out the, the weird contrast that McCarty had to show there was no protein, that it was all DNA, it was the genetic material, but Stan had to do exactly the opposite, just prove that there was no DNA, prove that the protein was the sort of hereditary material. And not only that, that story has a really interesting tidbit, which is that McCarty, despite or maybe because of his previous experience, was the only person who actually was willing to believe Stan Prisoner. He said, you know, you're going sort of following the money, so to speak. He didn't use that particular metaphor, but, you know, you went, you followed the specificity. And if you took out all the molecules that whether or not they should have, could have been the culprits, then what you have left is the possibility that this unlikely molecule is the active molecule. So DNA in his case, and tables were turned, and in the prisoner's case, it was protein. I think we just need a bit of background there for the listener. In the case of Stanley Prusner, his point was that he'd realized that proteins or come to the conclusion that proteins were the cause of prion diseases like Creutzfeldt uh, Jakob disease and um, Ukuru and having gone through this whole process where, where all this evidence had mounted that DNA is the molecule of inheritance and then the point is that Prusa had to undo all of that in a small you know situation to demonstrate that proteins and proteins alone can cause infectious disease in a small in number of cases and actually of course there's also a parallel in it somewhere else earlier where there was this whole debate about whether enzymes were proteins as well so so actually we've been through this sort of cycle of of, of debate and discussion and experimentation to determine the biochemical nature of 
all sorts of macromolecules and phenomena, you know, proving that the enzymes were largely proteins, proving then that DNA is a molecule's inheritance, and then prions, you know, the cause of prion diseases was again protein. So yeah, interesting how they, these same themes come around time and time again. Okay. And Jeff? Just to frame it, you know, Avery was famously a great storyteller of his lab's experimental investigations and discoveries. You can think of his stories as episodes in two very different but connected epics, an Iliad and an Odyssey. And one is this battle against deadly infectious disease, in this case, pneumococcal pneumonia. And the Odyssey is this 10-year process of purifying the transforming principle as DNA, full of heartbreak and, and heartache. And so McCarty really is the person who connected these two worlds, I think, with this, this DNA, because he was inspired by this story from the Iliad period when they're, when they're trying to understand the nature of virulence of pneumococcal cells. And he learned about this the way that everybody who came to the Avery lab learned about the work in, in the lab through what was called these Red Seal records. And I'll just quote from people who actually experienced, unfortunately, we do not have a recording of Avery giving one of these talks, which would have been invaluable historically and humanly, I think. And probably the closest document that we have is a letter that he writes to his brother, Roy, in 1943, explaining the work that is later published in the 44 paper. So McCarty says, the heart of the Avery process of orientation was a series of beautifully planned discourses that dealt with major lines of pneumococcal research. These discourses had come to be known by his young associates as Fess's Red Seal Records, a term that reflected their high quality and also the fact that they tend to be repeated in much the same form. Rollin Hotchkiss describes this as... Um, Avery successively played the parts of narrator, expositor, loyal opposition, and finally attorney in summation. These gems of perfection were continually revised and repolished. The highly organized presentation was a kind of debate with himself, punctuated rhetorical questions like now, why should that be, or what does that all mean? Debose himself says, these monologues have been thought out and were acted out in accordance with a carefully practiced formula. They were virtuoso performances in which the theme was developed with logic and clarity, starting from the historical background and ending with a rationale for possible future scientific approaches. The phraseology of these vignettes was remarkable, and he would repeat hesitations in his speech as if he was performing for the first time. But of course, it was, it was almost like an actor who had perfected these performances that he could spill out at will when a visitor came or when a new person came to the lab. And DuBose describes how he came to know Avery and he just it came to the famous Rockefeller dining room in 1927 as a graduate student at the New Jersey Agricultural Experimental Station and he sat next to Avery. I knew nothing of his work and he, of course, he knew nothing of me. With his usual graciousness, however, he inquired about my scientific interests and about the topic of my PhD thesis. I told him that I had been working on the microbial decomposition of cellulose and soil and had isolated several species of bacteria and fungi that could destroy that substance. He immediately became intensely interested and invited me to continue the conversation in his small office where he asked for further details about my work. Then he began slowly to suggest that my bacteriological studies with cellulose were related to his own work with pneumococci. As I hardly knew anything about medical microbiology, he patiently explained that these microorganisms owe their virulence to the fact that they are protected against the defense mechanisms of the body by an envelope, a mucus-like envelope, the pneumococcal capsule. This capsule, he told me, is made up of polysaccharide, a hemicellulose-like substance chemically related to the true cellulose that I was using in my own experiments. And then, as if by a casual gesture, but in fact deliberately, he took from the right-hand drawer of his desk a little tube containing a white powder labeled in his neat handwriting SSS3, specific soluble substance of type 3 pneumococcus, and shook it in front of me. And this is the same. He used to walk around in the early 1920s, Avery, with this same vial of type 3 specific soluble substance, the substance of the capsule, and shake it in front of Michael Heidelberger, who worked at that time worked in a different lab and would say, when can you come work on this, Michael? The whole secret of bacterial specificity is in this little vial. So Avery was, you know, seducing him with this little 
piece of chemistry that Heidelberg could work on. And so DuBose tells them how you could find an enzyme, a natural soil enzyme that could break down this type three capsule, which was medically the most recalcitrant to antibody therapy and also the most deadly of the main three types that they were studying. And McCarty, in I think an interview that Nuriger was part of, said that they didn't think they could go very much further with purifying the transforming principle of DNA. And that's when he thought to do something equivalent to what they, they had, of course, used crude DNA enzyme fractions in the 1944 paper, but he wanted to purify it. And in fact, Avery wanted him to purify it. Before they published the 1944 paper, and they went to the Princeton lab to see Wendell Stanley and Northrop, and they came back and they thought they're ready to go to publish this paper. Avery was still not satisfied. And McLeod asked, what more do you want, Fess? And what Avery really wanted was more purified preparation of the DNAs. And as McCarty said, you know, the, the enzymes that were used previously were destroying what the transforming principle was not. It was not protein. They used proteases. It was not RNA. They used RNAs. It was not the polysaccharide. They used the S3 enzyme. They wanted to find a, an enzyme that was specific for the substance that had a specific biological function. And moreover, to show that that substance had to be intact. And that's why it's important in this, the 1946 JEM paper that he talks about if you have a very slight decrease in viscosity of the high molecular weight DNA preparations that they were using, that they were purifying, you would lose activity. And the viscosity was an index of the molecular weight of these long chain DNA molecules. So that just as the S3 enzyme had destroyed the ability of antibodies to bind to the type 3 capsule, the DNA enzyme destroyed the ability, even slight amounts of the purified transforming extract to, to actually execute transformation. So, so I think McCarty makes a very big point, both in his book and his conversations with, with me and with Nirija, that this was really the inspiration and the connection that inspired this work. I just wanted to back up and clarify for our audiences The two names that Jeff mentioned that McCarty and Avery went to visit at the Princeton Labs, Wendell Stanley, most famous for his crystallization purification of the tobacco mosaic virus, which turned out to be a protein encapsulating a nucleic acid, and Kunitz, or was it Northrop? Kunitz and Northrop were both co-winners of the Nobel Prize for purifying enzymes. And so McCarty, when he did eventually go to purify DNAs, went to the best, to people who had been recognized for their work on enzyme purification. And I just thought I should add that. Michelle? Yes. There is in the, just to come back on the article of 1946, because McCarty and Avery say, okay, we have very strong arguments that the transforming principle is DNA. But those who don't accept that, I think it's uniquely because they had another model in their minds and they are unable to abandon this model. I think it's very interesting because it does not say it's because maybe there are some weaknesses in our argument. He says, no, it's different. They finally, they are so convinced of the past model that they are unable to abandon it. And I think it was some, somehow true. And it's interesting because rarely scientists uh, say this kind of things. It's not science. It appeals to psychology. And I think it's quite interesting that Avery and uh, McCarthy propose this explanation of the attitude of uh, Mirsky in this case. Yes, but you picked up exactly that that was a very personal statement. I mean, McCarty said this to Nirja and me, and I think it's actually mentioned in his book, that that's what Mursky was going around saying that their experiments, even with DNAs, did not disprove that DNA could be some carrier, could be form a cage around the actual transforming principle made of protein. And 
by destroying this cage, you destroyed the vehicle that would carry the protein from one cell to another. And he said that in the discussion, when McCarty writes in the third paragraph, the objection can be raised that the nucleic acid may serve merely serve as a carrier for some hypothetical substance, presumably protein, which possess the specific transforming activity. There is no evidence in favor of such a hypothesis and is supported chiefly by the traditional view that nucleic acids are devoid of biological specificity. That is directly addressed to Mursky. And you picked up on the personal tone to that because Avery was, I think, became very depressed about Mursky's persistent criticism. And McCarty was quite offended, I think would be a fair way of putting it. You know, I can totally sympathize with McCarty's feelings of offense that Jeff has just told us about. Because when I go back and look at this paper, the authors have been so meticulous. The paper is almost a textbook example of testing various if-then hypotheses, in this case about the identity of the transforming substance, and then eliminating the possibilities one by one. I realize that, as Michelle pointed out earlier, this paper and its companion, the purification of the enzyme, are not ex as exciting as the 1944 paper because they're not the first announcement. But they provide so much solid data. As Mark pointed out, and I agree heartily, they're providing the kind of data that seemed rather convincing that, yes, the material of transformation in bacteria, in pneumococci at least, was DNA. And so I'll repeat what I said in the introduction to this episode, framing it as a question now. Why do you think these papers have been so sidelined in history? I think it's just because they're not, as I think um, Michelle said earlier, they're not presenting anything really groundbreaking. They're confirming the uh, the previous paper and people are going to be much more interested in something that's radical and new than something that is incremental these are incremental papers they're incredibly important in the grand scheme of things and in the history of things but they're never going to get as much attention as the 1944 paper because they're just building on it you know they're incremental they're another nail in the coffin of the um theory that protein is the molecule of inheritance, but they are just that, a nail, not the coffin. Yes, just to pick up on what Mark said, in fact, McCarty told me that many people assumed that he already had a purified preparation of DNA in the 1944 paper. So they didn't even think that the purified DNA was something new. They just sort of assumed that, the, because they make a big point in the 1944 paper about using crystalline ribonuclease and crystalline trypsin and chymotrypsin. So somehow people who read the paper in a cursory way, which in my experience, many scientists tend to read long papers in a very cursory way, assumed that they were using a similarly purified version of the, of the DNA enzyme. Yes, following up on this, clearly Roland Hotchkiss thought that these were important papers. In that uh, 1954 symposium I uh, referred to, he says that we must admit the protein, which is a most unusual protein. It is a protein which is acting in very small amounts. It's a protein very stable to heat, to all sorts of things, proteolytic enzyme, alcohol, surface denaturation. And at the same time, other proteins are being systematically got rid of. This protein, the supposed contaminant in transforming agent, this protein is being concentrated. So this hypothetical protein is behaving completely atypically from all the other proteins that were in the initial uh, preparation. Yes, I just uh, wanted to add something more to all that was already said. Maybe we must think that transformation was a phenomenon limited to, at that moment, to one type of bacterium. I think it's something that probably was in the heads, in the minds of the participants of the Avery, of the McCarthy. Because, well, they had in mind also that probably transforming principle was a gene, and so what they were telling was true for all genes. Nevertheless, <laughs> they had only results on a very special phenomenon 
occurring in uh, Namokoti. And I think it was also an obstacle to convince the scientific community. And you know that after uh, Guavin will describe the same in uh, E. coli, but the results were not accepted, and so it was not really confirmed. And we had to wait long years to have transformation in other organisms. So I think it's something to have in mind, because it was also something blocking maybe the conviction of many people, because what interested them was a link between transforming principle genes and so our genes made of DNA. I uh, don't know, but I think maybe it's uh, something important in the discussion. Yeah, I think that actually what Michelle just said can't be overemphasized. And just think of the difference between knowledge and thoughts about bacterial genetics in 1944 and 1952 when Hershey Chase comes out. There's no Letterberg Tatum. There's no, bacterial genetics does not exist. Viral genetics does not exist. There's no Hershey Rotman. They're only able to transform one phenotypic trait, which is this capsule, and they can do different types. But it's not until I believe 1951 at a Cold Spring Harbor Symposium that Hotchkiss reports the transformation of another trait, which is penicillin resistance. Ironically, penicillin, of course, is the the emergence of penicillin at the beginning of World War One. Really, the all the stuff that Avery had been doing with serum therapy in his lab became completely outmoded. And there was tremendous resources, by the way, in New York Public Health in developing these serum and typing people who had pneumococcus and giving the appropriate serum. Mm -hmm. And Hotchkiss was able to show that uh, penicillin resistance could be transferred by transformation. So I think to put it that this could have just been a pneumococcal curiosity was very much a possibility. The other thing that I should say is this, of course, was the first case of horizontal gene transfer ever studied. You know, and we now know, of course, that pneumococcus have this whole machinery for passing DNA around this, and they have these machines for DNA uptake. And it's because they have this that they were able to do this experiment because there's naked DNA in the medium that these bacteria are passing each other. So I really think it's very hard to go back to that period and unlearn what we've learned since. But the ignorance about bacterial genetics, viral genetics, microbial genetics, much less about DNA and how DNA could have specificity, just permeated the worldview in which this paper came out. Oh, and, and that was true still in 1946. It's a point that Michel made a few moments ago, and you have to confirm it. But as far as I know, nobody in the Avery lab in this period made the connection that they've, they've got trans, transforming principle as DNA, transforming principle as the hereditary material. But as far as I know, they don't say, that means DNA is the gene, or genes are made of DNA. They don't seem to make that leap that genes are made up of DNA. Does the word gene in any of these papers? Well, while it's certainly true that the explicit claim that genes are made of DNA did not appear in any of the early papers, either in 1944 or in the 1946 papers discussed today, I clearly remember McCarty telling Jeff and myself in 96 something to the effect that if he and McLeod had, and this expression is a direct quote from memory, had our druthers, the statement that DNA is made of genes or DNA are genes would have been in the 1944 paper itself. Jeff, do you remember this conversation? Can you corroborate what I'm saying? Well, I don't have the quote right in front of me, but it is true. And what they failed to mention in the paper, and I think they could have mentioned, is that it had been known for decades, of course, that DNA is a major component of chromosomes in all higher organisms. And in fact, this point is made, I, I don't have the quote by Harry Afrusi Taylor, who was the last, Avery's last postdoc at the 1951 Cold Spring Harbor Symposium, that this is why this result electrified people, because DNA was not some substance from Mars that had never been studied before. It was known as a major component of chromosomes, but it was thought either to play a structural role, 
to be this midwife molecule in the protein genes replication. And as Michelle mentions in his masterly comprehensive history of molecular biology, the, the relatively recent discovery of ATP also out of that emerged the hypothesis that DNA may have some energy giving role in genic reactions. So, but the idea that it would possess what we now call genetic specificity was really rarely, if ever, mentioned. Thank you, Jeff. Also, I would add that when specificity was mentioned in these early papers, it was referred to what they called chemical rather than genetic specificity. So, for instance, in their discussion of the 1946 paper, McCarty and Avery said that although the enzymatic studies they were reporting on provided evidence for the specific role of DNA in bacterial transformation, these studies did not offer any clues about the chemical basis of the specificity. I just thought it was worth mentioning that and also wanted to bring up another instance of McCarty reiterating, granted from the vantage point of nearly 60 years later, that personally he had by 1944, little doubt that genes were made of DNA and that this idea would ultimately be accepted, only he wasn't sure about the best approach to resolving the issue. He remembered suspecting that it would need clarification of DNA structure, which was outside his own expertise as a microbiologist. And as we'll find out in the next few episodes, it did indeed take a few more years of structural clarification before the notion that DNA was the material of genes was completely accepted. We're running out of time now, but I wanted to turn the mic back to Jan for some final comments, because just a couple of days ago, he shared something with me which I thought captured the mindset, the intellectual climate of these years just perfectly. Jan? Yes, yeah, so this is a poem that Hotchkiss apparently gave at the as concluding remarks at this 1954 symposium on genetic recombination. And I'm just going to read the last verse. Now, lest we be too placid, there might be other genes that, instead of nucleic acid, are made up of proteins. How perverse are limitations, how incredibly tragic, that for each and every one of us, one or the other of these two hypotheses should seem relatively acceptable and the alternative one should seem like believing in magic. Thank you, Jan, for such a fitting conclusion to this episode of the DNA Papers. It would be difficult to top this poem, and so I won't even try. This has been a podcast from the Consortium for the History of Science, Technology and Medicine. I'm Nirja Sankaran and would like to thank our guests, Jan, Jeff, Mark and Michelle, as well as our audience. Please tune back in next month for the next installment in the series. <laughs>